Enough of this hack shit. Everyone knows the apex of casting are ingots. While I'm opening some packages, I like to preface this video. There are a handful of popular backyard casting YouTubers and thousands of casuals who would lead you to believe the pouring ingots is the furthest extent of foundry at home. I'm setting out to create a small series of videos that can expand the options that you may achieve from home. There's only a certain amount of times that you can melt down soda cans and copper wire before your hobby hits a massive roadblock. Also, many recyclers in the current day won't even accept ingots for cash, rendering this process nearly moot. Casting copper alloys is an ancient technology but now there are many modern advancements that may be slightly outside of the vision of hobbyists and hobby groups. This is part one in a series of building the furnace and the basic rules for not burning your house down. Also, as a disclaimer, this isn't a tutorial and I'm not responsible for damages to those who may have failed to do further research and planning. This is just a video on creating a very cheap furnace at 30 to 50% the price of name brand popular hobbyist casting setups for those who are a little bit more industrious. The most inexpensive ready-made vessel I could find for a furnace are simple 5 gallon metal buckets at about $9 shipped. Many people will use decommissioned propane tanks which is also a very great option if you can find them for free. The only modification they need is a hole to give you an opening to insert a weed burning torch head as the flame. I've listed all of the items I bought in the description. None of these are affiliate links or ads. I'm making no money off of clicking them. They're just exactly what I bought for this project. Due to economic forces, prices are all over the place and they were much lower when I started this build. Refractory cement in small batches is really expensive, so I wanted it to stretch its value a little bit further. In this setup, I used it as an inside liner for the metal bucket at about a half of an inch thick. Refractory cement will crack and disintegrate over time under direct flame and need to be replaced more often if used regularly. For this, I used a double liner as you'll see later on, which is a more cost effective way of maintaining a small, cheap furnace and keeps maintenance to a minimum. And here I'm just lining the bucket with the refractory cement. It's a simple process of just mixing it with water and setting it in place before it cures and hardens. And here is what I was talking about earlier with the double liner. This white insulation is called KO wool and it's far cheaper and easier to work with than refractory cement. It's equally as efficient as an insulator as well. For a small furnace, you want as much insulation as possible, so you need less energy to melt metal. And this double lining technique will allow you to burn at over 2000 degrees with just an everyday torch, consumer propane, and propane accessories. The added benefit to KO wool is that it's extremely easy to replace and you don't need to chip out a bunch of cement or replace your entire furnace if you only use refractory cement and it becomes damaged. You just remove the KO wool liner and insert a new sheet. And a warning, this is a silica fiber material. You should wear a respirator or N95 mask while working with it. Silica is very bad for your lungs. Since this is a cheap introduction build, I used a weed burning propane torch head for my flame. Higher end builds will show you diagrams and materials for integrated plumbing and piping, but I wanted to keep this simple and minimal. This is more than enough to maintain temperature and oxygen to melt at over 2000 degrees. And here goes my first test burn. There are different types of crucibles, so you should make sure to do research on the version that you buy. Some require quote unquote seasoning or preparation before you use them to melt metal. This one that I have is a common graphite crucible and the only preparation I did was to heat it up to a few hundred degrees and then it allow it to cool down to room temperature. Other types of crucibles require flux linings or more intensive tempering processes. For my second test burn, I decided to get the crucible red hot to see how much heat the furnace was producing and how long it took to get to temperature. You'll notice at the end, the crucible is too low in the furnace, which you can see by it not getting red hot like the rim. I fixed this by adding a layer of KO wool to the bottom of the furnace, which raised the crucible higher up so that the flame made contact lower on the crucible. And now for my final test burn. I cranked the torch up to the highest setting and raised the crucible up. 
This time, it heated much more evenly and quickly, as you can see by the consistent orange color. There's still a darkish section on the very bottom, but that's where the crucible is making contact with the KO wool, and it's not a huge problem. When I bought the bucket, I forgot to buy the metal lid that accompanied it for the extra $1.99. Insulation is extremely important to the efficiency of a furnace, so a lid is very necessary. The lid covers the furnace and holds in much of the heat produced, but it also needs to have an opening so that oxygen can flow freely through the system. You'll see in some hobby setups that low oxygen furnaces burn more like a campfire instead of a raging jet engine. If you have a campfire like flame, then you're lacking enough oxygen to mix with the propane and it's significantly cooler burn and sort of dangerous because there's a lot of unburnt propane floating around. You want a very vigorous flame. To make the lid, I just use scrap sheet metal. The lip is about one inch tall so that I have room for a half of an inch of refractory cement and a half of an inch for the KO wool lining. Since this is a simple cylinder shape, I welded in a few pieces of scrap steel so that when I pour the refractory cement into the lid, it had something to grab onto. Sort of like how rebar is used with regular cement, this will prevent it from sliding or falling out of the lid since it will be upside down. And here's the last part of the process, similar to lining the bucket. Refractory cement poured in at a half of an inch and a layer of KO wool on top of that for the disposable liner. The nice part about the KO wool liner is that it is squishy like a blanket and when you set the lid on top of the furnace bucket, they will smash together and create a nice seal so that the flame doesn't leak out of the crack. I also cut the hole on the lid of the furnace a little bit big. This was a contingency for what I was talking about earlier, which is oxygen flow. If the hole is too small for the oxygen flow, then it would need to be modified and widened, which is kind of a pain in the butt at this point. If the hole is too big now, you can just use an extra piece of KO wool and lay it over the top to cover part of it, which is an easier solution to controlling your temperature and oxygen. Here's the final fit. The two KO wool liners mash together to seal up the space between the lid and the bucket, forcing all of the heat through the lid hole. Now, some sweet B-roll to show off the finished furnace and its first full burn. Also, as I noted before, you want the flame to be loud and aggressive like a tiny little jet engine and not like a campfire. The flame should be blue and not orange. This means you have enough air or oxygen flowing through the system. If at this point it's just going at a whimper, you need to adjust before you move forward. Now all of the preparation and testing is finished, it's time to load up a crucible with bronze. I just grabbed some random blobs and sprues from other projects. I'd like to note that this is Everdoor UNSC873 alloy, which is a pretty standard alloy for bronze sculptures. This is not scrap metal or doorknobs or plumbing materials. It's reclaimed from ingots designed specifically for bronze casting. And if you've made it this far, there's one rule you really need to know. Make sure there is no water or moisture near you. Make sure that you lay KO wool over the concrete to prevent spillage. Moisture in concrete will cause explosions. Preheat all of your metal so that the moisture is burned out of the metal. Make sure all moisture and potential contact with moisture and water is completely minimized. It is so dangerous at this point for water to come in contact with molten metal. I rarely see this emphasized in other backyard casting videos. And here's one of the ways I dry out bronze before charging the crucible. You let it sit on the rim of the furnace and the heat will dry it out and remove all of the moisture making it safe to place into the molten metal. This is just skimming some of the slag or dross. These are impurities and oxides in the metal that are no good. This is not important at all or part of the process. I was just bored and stuck a piece of steel into the melted metal. Looks cool though. Finally, before I pour, I skim the impurities off the top once again. This removes the junk that floats to the top and leaves clean bronze for pouring. This goes back to my rant about removing moisture from everything. This sad excuse for an ingot mold gets placed on the rim of the furnace and all of the moisture burned out of it before I pour bronze. I hadn't made crucible tongs yet, so I came up with an ingenious plan. I covered channel locks with KO wool, but the KO wool just stuck to the crucible. 
I don't think what I'm doing is very dangerous, but I'm sure someone has a problem with it. You should buy or make crucible tongs to pour metal with. This probably isn't the best way to go about this. Ta-da! And finally, the magic. This video is sort of made with sarcasm and cynicism because pouring ingots is basically useless unless you're an industrial leader selling wholesale with a team of chemists and metallurgists checking your work. Planning for the apocalypse is cool, but not a given. And as I've said before, a lot of scrappers won't buy ingots because people can steal metal and hide them as ingots being untraceable. Plus the alloys are completely arbitrary and unknown and not very valuable for sorting. I like to create a series and channel which has a little bit more to offer besides just melting down alternators and extension cords every week like other channels repeat ad nauseum. If you're a beginner, that's a great introduction to the hobby but it doesn't leave any room for true wonders of what's possible. I have other videos showing slightly more complex versions of what metal casting is capable of and you should check them out. And I have two more videos following this one that increase your capabilities if you're serious about making something beyond a square chunk of metal. The next video will be building a burnout kiln from a cheap locker. This simple piece of equipment expands your casting options infinitely. It's a basic preheat oven, which you can place investment or ceramic shells into and attempt lost wax, lost foam, or lost PLA 3D printed castings. This will open many doors for those who want to take it a step further than ingots. Like and subscribe, even if you don't watch any of my future videos ever again, the subscriber count makes me look more important and it validates me to other people who stumble across my channel.